we're back for the second edition of uh, Unboxed, and we've had quite a fun conversation so far about how different um, we both are in terms of our dating ideas. So, uh, do you want to get them started about uh, your first ever date? When was that? When was when was the Ooh. first time you were with a boy and uh, call it an exclusive thing? Um, I think I was fifteen. Um, fifteen. I met this. Yeah, I met this. I think I was fifteen. I met this boy uh, at uh, at summer camp. Um, okay. And. Uh, and it was kind of hot and uh mm-hmm. you know he he played basketball really well um, <laughs> always a sports guy <laughs> yeah and you know uh, i had a huge crush on him and i kind of didn't realize i had a huge crush on him i think at some point the crush was reciprocated um, oh okay so so yeah that was probably my first time right and did you do yeah. anything about it when the crush was reciprocated? What did you do? What did you deal with? It? I um, he called and he said he loved me and uh, yeah, I cried a lot because um, I felt like I'd sinned close. because someone said <laughs> they loved me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, and I and I wondered if I'd lost my crush because it was finally reciprocated. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, oh, and I went okay. through that whole cycle of, you know, um, should should I like him back now? Because now it feels like it's been reciprocated. So uh-huh. somehow doesn't feel like love. Because somewhere in your head, like you see in a lot of the movies that love needs to be in some way unequal. Mm-hmm. Um, or like, you know, it has to be one-sided. That's when You're it's like the really... <laughs> <laughs> but how did it, how did it eventually uh, end or die down? It didn't or die. Did it so die so no no it didn't die. So um, eventually I felt like you know I was enjoying talking to him. Um, I wouldn't. I don't know. I don't know if it was love or not. But I you know I was enjoying talking to him and it felt nice. And mm-hmm. uh, so I think we sort of dated on the phone for about a year. Okay. <laughs> um, Long distance relationship, even when you're in Bangalore. Right, right, yeah. exactly. So, because you know, we met at camp and we lived far mm-hmm. away, and you know, uh, right. you don't have so many opportunities to like go Correct. out or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we I think we did for about a year, and um, eventually, I think I was in eleventh or twelfth or something like that. Then, obviously, studying had to take a priority. Uh, I wasn't allowed to be on the phone as much and mm-hmm. it was just getting logistically really complicated. And so I think we kind of mutually broke things off and said, we need to do other things with our life right now. And so, yeah. So that was, yeah. that was spoken of, like you actually had a conversation where you said, this is not, this is not good for us yeah. right now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. That's good. Cool. Yeah. Because yeah. when I imagine 15 year olds now, it's just like, if you don't want something to, go on you just stop talking you just cut all lines of communication that happens a lot i've seen that right. happen to a lot of kids kids that i know of and uh, yeah i've seen that let happen. me tell you that it's quite it's quite different at least um based on what i understand right so i was mm-hmm. speaking to a 17 year old the other day right. um, and he had just come out of a three year long relationship with somebody when um, he was 17 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's so he started dating this girl when he was fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, and this is recently, like you know, just a couple of months back. Um. So, and then he told me that they were taking time off to see other people, and and I was like, wow. Mm. Like, mm. um. And then yeah, I mean, um. Uh, Obviously, like kids these days are physically more liberal. Um, physical intimacy is not mm. that big a deal like it used to be. Because back then, like I think we held hands and that was the highlight of our romantic relationship. <laughs> <Okay>. Right. <laughs> um, but obviously, things are quite different and they make things a bit more complicated. I think. Is that is that a good thing, is or is that a bad thing? The 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 freedom to 
engage with whoever you want even as a younger person now is that a good thing or do you think it does more damage to be honest i don't really know i mean i don't necessarily have a judgment on it but personally i feel like having physical intimacy sort of spaced out in terms of levels over mm-hmm. a long period of time sort of allowed me the opportunity to enjoy things a lot more at a more slower pace mm-hmm. um i don't know how people feel these days um because things move a lot faster right like what do you they think? do yeah i i definitely think they do move a lot faster and things are a lot more easier like a 15 year old doesn't have to rely on his landline to talk to anyone anymore <laughs> he has whatsapp instagram facebook like i know a friend's 13 year old sibling who has access to all of these social media platforms everything so sure. not monitored sure. completely free i mean obviously the phone goes into the parents room at night and so that they don't use it all night but it's still a lot of freedom and it's a great thing it's a great tool you get so much exposure you know things at an earlier age you're aware of things that are going on and you're not in this a bubble that gets popped when you graduate from school so all those things are great but we've also seen how vulnerable kids can be because of this kind of exposure right right uh, uh, like for example your the, the 17 year old kid you were talking about right he has been through a three year old relationship or whatever he calls a three year old relationship right yeah so in a slightly different setting maybe breaking away from a person whom he's been with for 3 years could have been catastrophic for his mental health you know one of the things that i feel that is great nowadays is mm-hmm. you know having exposure to these things early on because i feel like you get a better grip on reality and you're able to deal with it much better than somebody mm-hmm. who experiences their first relationship at 30 for instance right mm-hmm. like if it breaks you you don't know how to recover from it and time lost is a lot mm. more precious at 30 because i think the older you get the harder it is to be able to go out and meet people right you have fewer sort of opportunities to socialize meet new people unlike let's say when you're 16 or 17 mm. right mm. yeah true true but let's talk about a communication aspect of it right kids these days don't know how to talk to each other they don't simply put okay um, they're more fluent uh, in the language and they can be very expressive they can paint vivid pictures with the language but you put them in front of another person their same age and they will give them a choice whether you want to communicate with this person have a chat with this person or get back to your virtual means they'll choose the latter earlier say when you were 15 you may have been awkward with that guy from the summer camp but you still made an effort to talk to them in person you still right. made an effort to meander through that clueless phase and get to an unknown destination which doesn't happen anymore right i mean we didn't have an alternative right like we like there was no choice you had to talk to people physically and like uh um, do, do you think the result of that is people these like, i don't want to seem like a a conservative person here but do you think people of my generation are just naturally not adept at communicating with people of the opposite sex because that because we have so many luxuries that we can just um lie back on and not do the hard thing of actually going out there and speaking with people yeah i think if you're a shy person um uh, you can indulge in being shy today because mm-hmm. there's so much infrastructure available for someone to remain shy right um yeah. you don't have to try and break out of your shell and uh, try and develop um so sort of communication skills mm-hmm. today right? Um, right but having said that this is this is some sort of a new world maybe this is the way things will work going forward right maybe virtual communication is just as important mm. as being able to talk yeah um in real life with somebody don't you think uh, because i know a lot of people who judge each other based on the way they text or the um way they sort of uh, right. portray themselves virtually um so maybe it's also important that you know how to communicate virtually which seems really weird but yeah <laughs> we were talking about this a bit earlier we were saying that uh since this is an entirely new generation that's so okay with tech 
they have formed their own rules rules that some of us older folk don't even know about like some of us like there's a rule that's ongoing that if the person of the opposite sex texts you you can't reply until 30 minutes otherwise you seem needy like these are rules that i wasn't aware of i still am not I'm still i'm not com- comfortable conforming to these rules so they this it's this entirely new game that only they know how to play and i don't know if it's necessarily a good game i don't know if it's a constructive play what do you think i don't understand these rules to be honest mm. uh, because this wasn't so much of an issue back then um because to be able to respond to someone right then and there over text was yeah. was great was a new thing right if someone texts me to be able to respond immediately over a text was mm-hmm. awesome mm-hmm. and why would you not do that like why would you yeah. wait for a day to respond to somebody so obviously yeah. i don't understand but having said that we had our own ways of kind of uh figuring out if someone is needy or not like um how how th- th- there was always that whole playing hard to get right like if someone asks you out you actually mm-hmm. take your time to get back to them and say i don't yeah. even know how that works anymore please explain <laughs> the last time the last time i ever heard someone my age say that they took time to reply was almost never so for instance right um back was back when i was in college so there was this guy um uh you know uh, who kept pursuing me a lot who kept trying to talk to me all the time and i wasn't interested in like i was genuinely not interested in. i wasn't um uh, trying to play hard to get or whatever okay. right um but then eventually i realized over a period of few months when he kept pursuing me i realized that in hindsight and in retrospect not then but like in hindsight i realized i enjoyed being pursued but this power struggle still exists this power struggle is a lot more nuanced now it's not as loud and brash and in the face as, as it used to be like you said uh, where you didn't reciprocate you did not want to be pursued it's not that out there it's a lot more subtle it it could be something as replying to messages late consistently like you're still replying because you don't want to be rude to the person and not reply but you are replying late on purpose even though you've seen the message earlier because you want that that feeling that the other person's more eager to talk to you than you are to talk to them yeah yeah and it's it's a lot more important. do you think the game is still the same but now it's a it's just a little more nuanced and with technology it makes things a lot more difficult Yeah, I'll tell you why it's nuanced today, right? Um, so I think what happens is I could go a few months without mm-hmm. responding to somebody back then, and they would still keep pursuing me, which is something you can't afford right. to do today, right? Right? Yeah. You can probably wait a day, but mm-hmm. you have to reply like you know the next day. Correct. The reason why you have to do this is uh, access to information is 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 a lot easier today, right? Correct. So this person who is pursuing you knows on the next swipe there is someone else. Yeah, the person who is pursuing you knows your best friend, knows your best friend's friend, knows your best friend's friend's friend. So that the options aren't limited. <laughs> yeah, the options are unlimited. Exactly right. So having that information, yeah, uh, makes them less loyal to you. Mm-hmm. Makes them less loyal to pursuing you. Correct. So you need to strike that balance between. seeming not needy but at the same time still responding so there is that fine line that you have to walk which i guess we didn't have to back then because the other person didn't have as much information uh, compared to a person pursuing you today right um, but in a way they didn't know there was somebody else waiting for them but in a way this fine line that you're talking about it leads to wasting a lot of time because back in the day if you didn't want to be pursued you could say hey i'm not interested back off nowadays people i mean unless uh, it's a drastic measure that they have to take people don't say this out loud people just want the other person to understand and some people don't get it so you just end up wasting a lot more of your time if you're the person who's receiving it or just like hey mixed mixed signals macha you know they say mixed signals right right 
I think that's a very social media phenomenon. Mixed signals do not exist. So I think it's because you're much more afraid. Like, although you know that on the next swipe there is someone else, mm-hmm. you're also afraid that maybe they're not there on the next swipe. Maybe the next swipe is 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 not going to be an ideal match, and that you're possibly going to regret who you left off. Mm-hmm. And that regret is a lot more pronounced today because. you can't kind of go back because you know the person you who you spoke to previously has moved on as well just like how you've moved on to the next wife you know the previous person has moved on as well so you don't want to be that person who says no and have that clear cut this is over and move on if you know you, you know this feels like this feels like my dad sitting for a stock market trade every single morning where you're like now should, should i buy it now now should i buy it or should i wait for it for another hour you know it shouldn't be this hard if you like someone if you genuinely like someone and have the warm fuzzy feelings for them it, it shouldn't be something that you think about uh but if you're willing to sit there on the fence and you know play i'll wait for it now and maybe let's see what happens then you are not just wasting your time you're not just wasting the other person's time you're also not doing your inner self any good because the more that these instances pile up the more you feel like i don't really know what i want i'd love to get your take on for someone my age you know mm-hmm. someone's uh, 32 um, looking to date etc what kind of advice would you have for them okay number one i'm uh, <laughs> starkly against the use of dating apps because I've had friends who use them, close friends who use them, and within no time you become this superficial person who's judging other people by the shape of their nose or by the shape of their eyebrows or what their bio is or how clever it is. Like you don't even know the other person. There was this whole movement that is that's this, this whole movement happening on Twitter right now, and I know it's mm-hmm. completely unrelated, but hear me out. Hmm. George Floyd's killing in the USA nightmarish experience now there was a video made by a black american man who said mm-hmm. just hear me out for 2 minutes i grew up here my mom's name is this i believe in this i'm a vegan i'm a 32 year old man i have a brother he just kept saying these random things about himself and at the end of the 2 minute video he said I wanted you to watch the entire two minutes video so that you get to know me before you call the cops. And that hit me so hard. You don't even know these people that you're swiping left and right on. You don't even yeah. know what they're like. You don't even see them as people. You see them as a commodity, and that right. to me is not okay. Right. So if right. you're a thirty-two year old willing to date, I'm sure you have a few good friends. If you're 32, the yeah. odds are you have a few people who found their soulmate already, and who some some of them who are married, and they know exactly what you're like. If that's if that person's a good friend, and they do a much better job at finding or introducing you to a person who's like you than a dating app. That's number right. one. And number two is I think you should definitely go out and socialize. And there's a lot of parties, a lot of gatherings that happen in town or happened in town until some time ago. So. Don't you don't you think there's less of friction, uh, let's say on an app, to you know to to swipe right on somebody initially? Like, yeah, yeah. So don't you think in some sense apps help people overcome their fear of being able to go ask somebody out? Initially, like, yeah. That's yeah. what I said. I'm stressing on the word initially. Initially, it's very easy. It's super easy. It's one of those quick fixes. on the longer term if you find yourself on the same app for maybe the fourth month or fifth month in a row you just you you're this person who has no sense of self esteem because you are measuring your self worth by how many people are matching with you right right that's interesting so what, would you have any advice for somebody who let's say struggles with you know going out um you know Mm-hmm. in in the open like physically and and you know striking up a conversation with somebody given that you're a communications coach mm-hmm. from from this perspective if like would you have any advice for people 
right what do you yeah. talk about how do you get yourself to talk to someone Let, let's say you find like mild mildly attractive uh, you know part i'll give you an incident uh, i'll write an incident sure. i was at i was at a college in bangalore a, a, a prestigious institute in bangalore giving a talk on public speaking and what storytelling means and stuff like that and i spoke about uh, an extensive portion of that talk was about how to get rid of the fear of you know public speaking and this one person from the audience one girl from the audience came up to me after the event to, to ask me a few questions there was a q and a session she came up to me and she said i'm i'm very socially awkward i don't normally do this but like i really want to know like i don't ask i don't come up to the speaker and ask questions after this this is super embarrassing for me but when you say construct a story and she asked a question okay she went on with a question she wanted to know something mm-hmm. about storytelling and this was a remarkable approach if you address mm-hmm. the fact that you're socially awkward right off the start you eliminate the assumptions you eliminate the other person guessing things about you and why you're uncomfortable and why you're behaving the way you are behaving because you've already acknowledged it do you think there's an element of vulnerability there that was attractive uh more than attractive i said i said remarkable because attractive for sure i said uh, remarkable because this is an approach that i hadn't thought about hmm. this is an approach that i had community not mentioned in my uh talk about getting over public getting over the fear of public speaking right now if you have a speaker who, like you know shibulal uh, the infosys co-founder yeah yeah so his uh, daughter was a panelist at a conference i attended and i think the name is shruti shibulal mm. yeah she was mm. at the event and she was supposed to deliver a talk or a speech and uh, Mm-hmm. she started off by saying you know i'm not the sort of person who goes up on stage and speaks uh, this is something mm-hmm. that is very uh, different for me and mm-hmm. she suddenly broke the ice with the audience right right like everyone knew that everyone could find a piece of themselves in her right 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 so she was vulnerable off the start which means everyone got comfortable right interesting um that's interesting that you say that because you know this is one of uh one of the sort of uh strategies i use when i introduce two people um i usually plant uh some of people's um deep uh rooted insecurities in the introduction mm-hmm. so that they don't have to worry about it and this person who's talking to them starts with complete awareness of this person both positive and negative there's there's another approach i sort of used which uh, tends to mask the sting you know mm-hmm. so i normally do the uh, one compliment and one exposure mm. uh, technique like i will say one really nice thing about them that's very flattering and i'll bring them right back down to <laughs> ground zero <laughs> so then they have nothing to complain about because i'm right yeah i'm doing that for both people it's making me like think about how introductions help sort of sober things down temper things down and what what do you think apps can actually do better like if you know apps are the way for discovery what can they do better to actually make introductions seem more natural because at the end of the day app is also making an introduction app <laughs> friend i would i would put a filter okay so if you match with somebody say on tinder and the guys or or the, the guy or the girl is sending the other person a pickup line to start with if the person starts in the pickup line directly unmatch i'd put a filter there like only if only if the conversation starts with something meaningful where you're saying something nice and constructive i would let that conversation go on otherwise i will make the app disconnect and unmatch these two people <laughs> really like what if the guy said hey hi i'm fred flintstone what is that a pickup line yeah cuz i can make your bed rock oh my god <laughs> no unmatch unmatch <laughs> <laughs> and definitely i will leave i will um, super match them if one of them starts with a bad joke right right, right? cuz <laughs> that's just me 
Okay, that brings me to another question, right? So, what is a good way to start a conversation on an app? Um, uh, I think, again, not just on an app. Even if you're talking to someone on WhatsApp or just sending somebody an Instagram DM or LinkedIn messaging someone, know what you want the other person to feel. Especially in India, if you're on a dating app, it's already assumed that you're a creep if you're a guy. Okay. okay, it's it's an assumption that you have to fight against, break that right. assumption, and then you can start a meaningful conversation. That right. takes quite some time to break. Right. So I would say right. just start with a meaningful, hey, how are you? I just want to have a nice conversation. Something as simplistic, bland, plain and simple. Because the moment you try doing something extravagant, you are not doing your creep status any good. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. What's the advice for women, though? Like, you obviously spoke about it from a guy's perspective. Like, what do you find attractive when a woman texts you? Hmm, this is a difficult question to answer because I'm... In fact, it may just be me saying this, but uh, mm-hmm. women on dating ha- apps have more liberty to say whatever they want to begin the conversation with because supply demand. Okay? No, but let's so, put this on a spectrum. What is... What is okay? What is acceptable? And what is, wow, that was hot. Like just based on what they say, this is this is nothing to do with how they look or like whatever. It's just what is a great conversation started by a woman versus yeah okay you know I don't hate. See, that. I would always start steady. I would always start steady because if you start with something really hot, now you've got to consistently put in that effort to remain hot. But what if you're a great like conversationalist and you can actually pull it off? That doesn't necessarily. I've seen the greatest conversationalists. Um, for example, okay, I could. Okay, let me give you a perfect example. The no- mm-hmm. Normally, whenever I go and give talks, I start with something very humorous, funny. And my if it's a short talk, it ends up being entertaining for. And after the talk, people come and speak to me in person, and. They ask questions and they want to have a conversation with me after post getting off stage. And now they're like, hey, are you funny only on stage? I'm like, oh, excuse me? Listen, that's a performance. This is me. Right. Right. <laughs> so that's the right. same thing that happens even on dating apps. Because right. eventually you want to meet the person, right? Right. You don't want to seem completely different than what you are in person. Sure, sure. You want to maintain, because consistency is key, I think. I think consistency goes a long way. If you're somebody But first impressions also matter, right? Like first impressions matter for you to even just, let's say you have 10 people texting you. Um, mm-hmm. Like what helps make a great first impression? I can actually give you an example, right? I, uh, <laughs> I sometimes cold message people a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like how you guys DM on Instagram to hate on somebody. Um, I cold message people a lot to kind of do B2C sort of business development where I try to find out if someone's single and get them to sign up with me and so on. There have been uh, instances where I've absolutely enjoyed the first 10 seconds of speaking to somebody where I felt like, wow, you know, I tapped on an awesome single person. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you know, I remember this one, uh, one time where I <laughs> randomly friended somebody on Facebook, uh, because I had a feeling based on their pictures, etc., that they might be single and they might be suitable for one of my clients. Um, I said, Hey, how are you? I was keeping it very vanilla, try uh-huh. to ease in the creep factor and so on. Um, and the person's like, I'm good. Mm. Uh, and then I was like, Oh, great. Um. Uh, impressive like you don't even know me but mm. uh, you know you're talking to me like you've known me I said mm. Mm. and the other person said well I know exactly why you're pinging me ah. yeah. and I was like ah. wow, I see mind. I see I see. I see I see yeah that's that's something that you know? I w- would add okay that's a that's a good uh, yeah. that's a good example you reminded me of something nobody wants you to talk about yourself when you start a conversation. Right. If you're talking to, if you're a guy talking to a girl, talk about the girl. Right. First 10 texts, 15 texts, 20 texts, just talk about her. Right. Make her feel like she's a... 
she is the center of attraction right but i tried the same thing on a boy right where there was this one person who kept stalking me on linkedin mm. he would keep coming and look at my profile every few days mm. um <laughs> and i knew why he was doing that because i knew he was single because i had seen his picture on a matrimonial website at some mm. point of time and i knew he was single and available and i said hey i know why you keep looking at my profile let's talk mm. you know i'm a marriage broker i know you're single let's talk mm. now what came back to my profile oh wow <laughs> wow so what wow. so what works for women i can speak only on my behalf whatever sure. i whatever has worked for me right sure i love talking about myself that's just something in somebody needs to know about me so whenever right. somebody genuinely showed interest in what i am like i loved it right okay but not too fast there's there's got to be there's got to be a measured technique where you're trying to explore the other person it shouldn't seem um intrusive it shouldn't seem right. like this person's interviewing me but right. at the same time i want this person to make me open up because guys this is one thing that guys never do is open up right after getting into the relationship he'll tell you that he has anxiety <laughs> right so this is something you need to discover with off this you know off the back got it got it interesting interesting so do you have examples of what's um talking about you yet mm-hmm. not intrusive for the first let's say first conversation okay so i had a friend of mine match with her school friend mhm on tinder mhm okay so she came to me and she said listen i matched with this person from school i used to have a crush on this person in school but i haven't spoken to him in years Right. It's anything I see is going to seem pretentious because he knows me. Right. We were we were right. neighboring classes. How do I start conversation? Right. Like address the fact that both of you are on a dating platform looking for love. Right. Address the fact that both of you have swiped right on each other. Right. There is no power struggle. He has also swiped right on you. Oh, correct. No, sure. he also swiped right on me. No. I'm like, yeah, that's how you matched. Like right. he has also right. shown interest in you, which means you, right. your confidence should be at an all-time high. Right. So talk right. to him about why he's on the dating platform. Talk to him about right. why you both matched, and say that. He, talk about him saying, "Listen, I remember you from a long time ago. I think you really had a glow up. I think you look really attractive." That would be a sweet thing to say. For any tense situation, if it's a pres- presentation at work, if it's you confronting somebody because they wronged you, if it is talking to a friend who's bitched about you. if it's starting a conversation with a potential lover any of these situations can be tense can be mm. extremely tense and make you anxious the best way to diffuse the anxiety is to address the situation i know a lot of people use self deprecating humor to yeah. ease the situation oh, what sure do you think do. about that i sure do every so for those of you who don't know the viewers i know i look like a perfectly handsome person on video right now but uh, i'm not i'm not a very tall person i'm 5 feet 5 in just tall <laughs> <laughs> i'm 5 feet 5 in just tall so i'm a average height indian okay and uh, sometimes women tend to say that you know i'm looking for a taller guy so that doesn't always work on my in my favor um so whenever i go on stage to give a talk or something uh, this is uh, this is the worst thing to happen to any speaker on stage is to stand behind a podium is to be given a lectern to speak and speak behind so i always disconnect the mic from the lectern and come outside and say listen i am 5 feet 5 inches tall i want you all to see all 5 feet 5 inches of me <laughs> like every single every single piece of me and right. that always draws a laughter and this is one thing i say another thing i say is listen so i'm genuinely acrophobic okay i, I cannot deal with heights i i'm genuinely acrophobic and i was like Yeah, that explains why I'm five feet five inches tall. Because after that, I was like, no, 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 it's a scary world up here. <laughs> so, yeah, that I'm sure that looks like a pickup line, right? No, oh, yeah, for sure. I think I think <laughs> it would. But that's that's what I'm trying to say. If if you're insecure about something, being able to laugh at that insecurity takes away people's ammunition against you. Interesting. 
I want to get back and touch base upon the point where do you think a virtual interface is actually impairing your ability to communicate with people on the longer run where you said somebody needs to seem hot or somebody needs to seem attractive on the first or second text but that text wouldn't work as a real life line do you think people are applying the same principles to real life and failing miserably because they're two different games in person and virtual you cannot say right. the same things that you say over text in real life yeah i mean i do i do understand i feel like the the text game and the real life game is yeah. fairly different it is but i think i feel like there are very very rare moments when mm-hmm. they sort of converge okay. and i think when they do it's great right like what um for example like you know uh, i i actually spoke to my husband for 2 years just over text we right. never spoken to each other uh, over the phone didn't meet each other for 2 years um and i think we were very very comfortable talking to each other right. over text right um because it was almost like we were each other's condiments mm. like side dishes sort mm. of thing um so i was very apprehensive to meet him in person because i felt like the flavor might be quite different mm. like when we met in person i felt like our our equation or our relationship would be very very different mm. but thankfully it wasn't and mm. i felt like that for me was the cue to say oh this is fabulous right like um we were so comfortable with each other behind screens and we could completely be each other and open up so much behind screens and i was afraid and i felt like we couldn't do that in real life mm. but our very first meeting when we were able to do that mm. made me feel like we could open up in any situation and deal with sort of any situation but that doesn't happen very often that's because that's also because you spoke to him for 2 years it's very difficult to put on a facade for 2 years it's not possible if yeah, you are speaking true, but i i do have friends who who are good friends who've been my physical friends for the longest time but i don't necessarily share the same relationship with them over text versus okay. in person so there's this friend of mine back in school really good friend um who i would talk to extensively on the internet after school like you know on google messenger like yahoo messenger or google talk or whatever um we would talk about so many things and then uh when we met in person after like summer holidays or like something we just couldn't talk to each other she mm. like she just talked to me at all mm. and then after we went back home she pinged me and she said hey sorry i was preoccupied i couldn't talk to you and then we had like a great half an hour conversation <laughs> i was like this is really weird like uh. this is extremely weird cuz i know you were not busy you were sitting right next to me but you were not talking to me <laughs> but here we are talking like nothing ever happened so you know, this this possible. this tends to happen to men a lot i didn't know this happened between women because here it's a recent incident where it was a friend's birthday uh, a really close friend of mine and someone who might have he's almost family times okay but he's a guy so i can't really open up to another guy okay so <laughs> you know this uh, male male cannot get uh, talk about emotions concept no yeah so yeah i yeah. sent him a text on his birthday i said listen I wanted to say something really heartfelt to you um i just wrote him a long message about all the things that i really appreciated about him and why i loved him so much sent him the message i happened to meet him the next day and i couldn't make eye contact with him <laughs> i was like shit i said all these things to him yesterday <laughs> I've recently become very active on Twitter. Okay. And Twitter is a place that empowers introverts. Right? Twitter is a place where people without hesitating say whatever they want to say. Even if it's about feel I know several accounts that have thousands of followers and all they tweet about is being needy. <laughs> all they tweet right, about is right. being uh, is talking about how they don't get attention and right it's just a quirky account where they talk about all their quirks right right that brings me back to the point 
where you are addressing your insecurities on the internet but do you have it yeah. in you to address your insecurities in person and if not how do you do it in person how do you um as a relationship coach tell someone that whatever you do on text take it to real life however you mm. communicate as somebody who communicated with your now husband for 2 years on a virtual platform how do you coach someone and say whatever you're doing virtually can happen in real life right i usually i usually tell people uh, to take it slow um, especially introverts um you know if you've been texting each other a lot um try to let's say speak virtually like this right you know talk to somebody virtually and mm. you know if talking for a long period of time is exhausting you know set set time say you mm. know i'm going to speak to you for 30 minutes let's do a call for 30 minutes mm. take it slow without rushing into anything so that you don't like burn out quickly right, right. it also allows you to figure out at different stages whether you mm. can carry on or not mm. Mm. Um, yeah So yeah that's normally the kind of like advice that I give people who who are not very comfortable talking in person if somebody approaches you a client approaches you and says um i want this this sort of a person you immediately know that they don't know what they want they're telling they have very contrarian views so how do you help them simplify what they're looking for how do you help them find who they are and who would be good for them right so i usually take them on a little bit of a journey there are different steps that mm-hmm. that we follow to get from who they are to who mm-hmm. they want right mm-hmm. um so my interactions with clients are, are are usually very like usually obviously confidential it's a safe space for them to open up talk about themselves so what i make them do is at first as we spoke over last time i make them uh, do a list of adjectives about themselves and mm-hmm. i get them to separate it out in terms of who they think they are and who others think they are and we get down to a few core uh, adjectives that describe who they are till they're convinced right we go mm-hmm. over multiple iterations of it and then we take that and say where does this person that you describe mm-hmm. find comfort what kind of a relationship does this find this person find comfort in like for example mm. if you're insecure you find comfort in a relationship where you're not judged where you get your space to be yourself and so on right and then we translate that into who brings these values into a relationship right we identify the types of people who bring the sort of values that you want in a relationship we identify a few different personas that can bring this and then you know what kind of people you're most likely mm. to get along with right, right and 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 then we use proxies to identify those character traits mm-hmm. that you can then use on let's say a dating platform or a matrimonial platform or like even physically in person right where you can use those pro- proxies to find out who are you most likely to get along with and be compatible with right so right 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 we go on this journey which takes a good let's say you know 5 to 6 weeks okay to really figure out wow. at the okay. end of which people do do have some sense of direction in terms of how to think about partner search in general okay what if so i recently read an article about uh, you know tony robbins right the the motivational speaker uh, on the states so he has a coaching platform where he's employed several trainers who do a 3 month program with people who buy mm-hmm. their training programs to achieve what they want to achieve in life it's pretty ambiguous right so right. this one person wrote a first hand article about what that experience was like for him he got a personalized coach and they would get on a call every week and they did goal setting for them uh, for, for himself and uh, by the end of two uh, by the end of 3 weeks he found out that he wanted to get into video editing hmm. okay so the next 3 weeks after this was about finding the right tools finding the right opportunities to get make video editing a career now after a 6 7 good weeks he had the shameful call with the same trainer that you know what this this isn't working for me this was a misdiagnosis you know what i actually wanted to stand up comedy hmm so if something like that happens to you how do you reroute the entire 
entire pathway and has this happened to you yeah it does happen to me a lot of people uh, come to me saying they want to help me uh, so they want my help to define what they're looking for in a partner right right, right, um, right. and so you kind of start on that journey you start uh, thinking about who you are and what you're looking for blah 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 and you spend 3 4 weeks hmm. just arriving at who you're looking for right and in the fifth week they come back to you and say but i can't get over my ex <laughs> <laughs> and then okay. you realize it's a mixed diagnosis i should yeah. have figured out in the first place mm. that what this person is trying to do mm. is get over their past right and they're looking at a new partner as a distraction or a mm. replacement for the ex mm. so they can get over the ex right right so 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 i mean it does happen to me a lot so <laughs> what we do is i i at that point i give them a choice i say mm-hmm. i i normally work with people on very limited engagement mm-hmm. i say i will work with you only for five sessions or 10 mm-hmm. sessions at the most beyond which we will not work together mm-hmm. because oh. i think if you are not able to make an impact on someone in five sessions mm-hmm. likely you are never going to be able right. to make an impact right 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 um it kind of works like therapy in some sense right mm-hmm. like if if you don't benefit from therapy in five sessions it just mm. becomes a crutch right you're not able to function independently correct um, correct so i give them an option i say hey um you want to start over again mm. with the actual sort of cause that we've identified mm. um do you want to do this again and help work through what you're actually looking right for help for. right um and you know it, it's their choice at the end of it they can either you know um go through this journey yet again with the correct diagnosis or they can figure things out on their own mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that's that's what i normally do but like this diagnosis does happen because you rely on information that a person is giving you right uh, yeah yeah you could try and dig but then if they trying to throw out data at you that they want you to see it is like likely there'll be a missed diagnosis it works like like a medical doctor if you tell yeah. them the wrong symptoms they're going to make the correct. wrong diagnosis correct correct but how do you make sure people don't or rather let go of the baggage from the previous relationships that's something they have to do on their own but people tend to carry their baggage from one relationship to the next and then the next and then the next and by the time you are left with making a life altering decision you have so much baggage that you don't know which direction to look in so carrying baggage is not a bad thing okay uh, it's uh, it's not a bad thing at all and and i think a lot of people uh don't see it this way they think yeah. that when you get into a new relationship you should be completely over the previous one and i think it's a bit unnatural uh, mm-hmm. to want that uh, so i say it's okay to carry baggage but what mm-hmm. i help them do is figure out what that relationship meant to them what mm-hmm. they'd like to carry forward and what they'd like to let go right um and i say it's okay to always love the person the way you did even though you're with somebody else and that kind of blows people's minds they're like what no when i'm married to someone i want to be married to this person not mm-hmm. love anybody else i don't mm-hmm. want to have feelings for my ex mm-hmm. i said no one can take that away from you you can't change that yeah right so Correct. it's okay to carry baggage but then i feel like you know reduce it to like a cabin bag yeah <laughs> don't lug the whole correct with that's when it's a problem yeah yeah i think uh, <laughs> my next question is going to be one of our last few questions and this is something that everyone in the world wants to learn how do you maintain a healthy relationship with your ex and not let it get, get in the way of future engagements kill them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you are so you are someone who is completely opposed to the idea of maintaining uh, an equation with the ex no i think like that i think uh, i don't think you should strive to have a healthy relationship if mm-hmm. you do it's fine if you don't okay. 
you don't right like for example i am not in touch with any of my exes mm-hmm. and it wasn't by design i mm-hmm. didn't say hey listen i need to segregate my life completely and i shouldn't be in touch with my exes right. it just drifted apart like we just didn't have a relationship like you know there, there's a different narrative actually that's going mm-hmm. that's doing the rounds but people are like here's this person whom you were so dependent on whom you spent every single day with whom you spent your whom you confessed your deepest stuff the secrets to and suddenly when you break up and that person stops existing for you in real life it's like a ghost where they've left so many memories for you but they really exist in real life you see them you see how they're doing in real life but they're not there for you so they've mm. left this void and there's this ghost that your ex is ghost that's meandering in your life so it's not you my question is how do you deal with that that presence of all the memories so i let them be they there i let them be it's totally fine like i don't think it's a problem i think um, i think it's just a part of who you are right um, those memories aren't going to go away um, mm-hmm. they're going to be just as fresh i think the only the only uh, you know for the lack of a better way of putting it the only thing that people people do very often that is very um, counterproductive is uh, they indulge in those memories and they extrapolate them thinking that this person or this relationship that you shared with this person will grow in the same direction mm-hmm. uh, like for example you know let's say you're in a relationship with somebody right now mm-hmm. um, and uh, something goes wrong with this relationship or like you know you're thinking back about your past and you're only remember remembering the good things of mm. the past you say hey maybe i can go back to this person and mm. things will be great again that extrapolation that we make into the future or into our present mm. based on the past i think is a little bit misplaced because okay what you have is a memory right right, right. um that memory doesn't necessarily mean that that's how that relationship would have grown right Right. So I think that's a mistake that people do very often um mm-hmm. and that's something I avoid doing. Right. right when I think back about the past and I you know reminisce about something good uh-huh. I say yeah that was great it was nice. Yeah. Now Yeah instead of completely denying that you didn't have a good time at all and you regret the entire experience. Yeah. That's yeah. a better approach. Yeah. Yeah. I say but it's a memory. I know it's yeah. a memory. And yeah. I and I keep it in its place. Right. I think the last yeah. question that I'm going to ask now is something related to what we just spoke about. I know a few people first hand who got back with their exes. You know, with a break in between when they dated other people and then they eventually got back with their exes and they're happy. The happiness portion of it. How do you come to terms with things that went wrong in the past? And how do you not let that affect your relationship with the same person? wow um i don't i don't personally have a lot of experience in this mm-hmm. uh but just based off of what people have told me mm-hmm. um uh and i'm going to bring something that you like uh, is is being able to communicate about it is uh, is being able to talk about it being able to talk about what didn't work for you and finding ways that work for you mutually mm-hmm. to deal with in the future right, right. Uh, for example if um, let's say you know uh, this is something that happens a lot right like where somebody cheats on you uh, and you break up with them and you go see other people but then you figure out that you know everything else is great about your life and you get back with this person you need to talk about it you need to address how you felt mm-hmm. you need to address how it affected your relationship and the other person needs to tell you and talk to you about how they're not going to do this mm. to you again and and keeping that conversation alive those communications channels alive is really important for you to be able to have a better relationship because if okay. you're not going to talk about it likely the other person can cheat again and mm. and you know you just have to live with it yeah I, yeah i feel like communication plays a huge role uh, 
in in being able to not regret what happened in the past right right yeah yeah i, I think that was that was great advice and i'm sure a lot of you, viewers will find all of what we spoke about very useful today uh thank you so much for taking out your time viewers and uh, we had a great time talking about this and let us know what you want to hear us talk about in the future uh priyanka do you have any closing statements to the viewers yeah don't be shy leave some comments uh, if yeah. you would like us to talk about something i hope you have a great time listening to this the way we did talking about it cheers yeah. until next time